Yeah, Phil, Phil mentioned last week he was stepping off of maintainer duties. So I was wondering if uh, if we should discuss some of that stuff here. I know I know I know there's quite a bit of discussion in like chat rooms and uh, in like repo discussion or repo issue boards and such. Um, is that, is, that, is that situation all okay? Like the PureScript compiler, like maintenance and uh, Wait, updates I've seen for the ticket seems to suggest that there's people volunteering for things and Phil said he's going to do something about it. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's right. There was an issue made uh, to request uh, new maintainers for things. Where is that issue at? I just posted on it, so I, so I should be able to find it. I did put it into the chat. All right, yeah, Christoph found it. Okay, so yeah, it looks I don't like think there's anything that leads like immediate attention. The stuff that is like necessary to keep everything running smoothly is distributed across people anyway. So I think we're good. Oh, great. Okay. So I don't normally do this hack weekend thing. This is my first one that I've been to, so I'm not entirely sure what the process is or if there is one or... Um, yeah, there's not really a set process, I believe. Um, well, we used to have one, right? Where we did, like every two weeks we did like a presentation thing. And then every other two weeks we did like a hack thing. Mm -hmm. Which is what this but, is, right? This is the hack thing? <laughs> supposed to yeah, well... <clears throat> What it has evolved into is that we just meet every two weeks and everyone who has something that you likes or they like to show, you just do a little presentation and if someone wants to hack on something, you just do that. Got it. So Got it. It's okay. a bit more freeform, but it worked well. Got it. There's that Google Doc that's, that's passed around. Yeah, so yeah, I'm curious if we want to do that same thing for today too, just uh, uh, do whatever, or if we want to uh, I don't know, like find stuff that needs to be done and then request to be done. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what to do. Well, I can chat about stuff I was working on. Um, if that's okay. Um, so in, in the Google Docs that, uh, that was linked in the gathering, I'll just paste that there, um, I put the, there's a section called public website infrastructure. And so what I was trying to do the last couple of weeks, basically my free time was um, trying to get the community server that's there. There's a repo, but all the stuff is a little outdated, but um, I, there's an issue on there that basically says, um, should we move to next? Like it's the for number one issue, I guess, issue number one. Um, so it's commenting on there. And then apparently um, most of the stuff in that repo is still relevant, which is fine. Um, however, I started building it locally um, mixifying the entire community server. Basically, my goal is to uh, be able to deploy a mixified container to somewhere in like one command. I, I don't want any have to log into a server, edit a file, change something, and then like it becomes a one-off Snowflake configuration. Like I want to avoid that. Like if we could deploy all the set of services together um, in sort of like a single shot, uh, to me like that's really maintainable, pretty easy to do. Um, so. I've been working on that. One of the issues I've run into, um, and maybe we can get some feedback from here to see like what's the right way to approach this, is um, the recent version of Flare um, that Try PureScript uses. Um, like there's a dependency, of, uh, which the Sparkle package is a dependency, but there's it doesn't work with like the 11.7 uh, compiler version. So I need to figure out how, A, what versions are running on TriPureScript 
uh, website today, and if all the backends are running the same version, and like I just don't have the information. <laughs> like I, I just don't know how to get that approach that because I'm trying to build it locally, and I just I don't have enough info. Yeah, so I just tried to look at the JavaScript that it generates for the flare mechanism. But it seems like it strips out the comment, which is usually at the top, which is like generated with PureScript version so and so. So that's, mm -hmm. um, that's a little unfortunate. But I mean, we could just, I guess, we could ask Phil to just log into the server thing and just ask for the, for, for the version of things. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, isn't I think Sparkle is maintained pretty, pretty well. So I was. Yeah, it's just that the uh, it, so all the backends on Tron PureScript they all use um, what you call it. They use the PSC package for package management, and yes. currently they all um, point to the package set that's maintained on the PureScript repo, like the master version, basically of it. And in that one, Sparkle was removed um, because when it was updated, I believe for the latest compiler uh, version update, maybe. Uh, but it, in relation to that, the Sparkle library is removed from that package set. So now if you try and build try PureScript locally and try to get the backend running for Flare, it just doesn't work because that Sparkle package is missing from the package set. So. Two different problems, I guess. A, what compiler version is that particular backend using? And B, uh, which packet set is it using? All right, we don't have to solve this right away, okay. right now, but <laughs> at least get pointed in the right direction, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah, well, maybe one. Uh, does every backend get its own PSC package file? Yes. Or do they all? Yes. Okay. So, well, I guess the simplest thing to do would be to just fork off the 0117 tag or something and just add what's necessary to make these things fly. I tried doing that. Turns oh, out okay. Sparkle doesn't compile with the latest um, version. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I'm kind of stuck wait. in the middle. <laughs> that sucks. We didn't intend to make it a breaking release, right? It's 0117. It's not there's, 12. There's some what change. Broke? Uh, let me pull it up and see. Because um, that's kind of a bummer. There's some so, dependency issue that, like, there's not a right instance or something. Um, paste that. There we go. Um, so apparently, Justin actually commented on this a while ago, I think, maybe. Um, or maybe this isn't the right issue, but the compilation basically still doesn't work. If you try and pull the latest packet set, you add Sparkle to it, and you try to compile it, it just doesn't work. Like oh, I see what's going on here. OK, so it's not, it's not really a compiler, a compiler change, but Smolder changed, which is. Yeah, and there's some. And it depends. Yeah, OK, so Sparkle depends on Smolder, and then yeah. and it's not compatible with the newest version of Smolder. But we could oh, just right. use an older version of Smolder then, probably. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So yeah, so when I meant the compiler, wasn't compiling for this thing. Um, my bad. I was actually talking about PureScript news. Um, that won't build anymore with 11.7 because of some um, way the instance dependencies are declared. You're no longer allowed to use commas and parens. You now have to specify each one of them with uh, fat arrows in between. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Okay. That was 0 0.10 to 0 0.11. So that's Got a it. break which happened a while ago. But yeah. Got it. I I th I think PureScript. Well, rightful to say. Uh, who's maintaining the thing? So maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right. So maybe we can just figure that out. Right? Not maintaining. <laughs> who wrote it initially? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's maintained anymore. Uh, uh, Pure script news. We're talking about. Sorry, a quick question here while we're on the subject of uh, try PureScript. It doesn't uh, bother anyone too much. Oh, wow, this video, it works. 
Um, I'm just kind of curious, and maybe there's a, someone's done this. Has anyone actually tried to uh, compile something try pure scripty with the GHCJS and just see if that approach works? Is that crazy or? Sorry, what do you mean? Um, actually running the pure script compiler in, on the client side. Uh, that used to be the thing. So back oh, in it the day. worked that way in the past. Like really back in the day. So like even before I was here, so like version 0 0.5 something or 0 0.6. Um, the, they tried to write pure, the pure script compiler in pure script. And yeah, I saw that a, project. Yeah. 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 And it was a bit of a disappointment to find out that just compiling the compiler with GHCJS ended up being faster than doing that. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just because, yeah, GHC is a really good optimizer compiler. So, yeah. and it's really good about compiler libraries. Anyway. Um, yeah, but so that used to be the thing, but that's still a pretty big binary and it's, Still kind of slow compared to what we have with PureScript, which is like nice and fast. I'm not sure if it compiles with GHCJS anymore. We haven't tried for a long time. Uh, you could try, I guess, if you really wanted to. I was just curious. Yeah. Uh, Ali is written that way. It's really interesting. Um, using service workers, and I'm not sure if you know Ali. Ali is the try PureScript for Elm. And they're using uh, uh, what are they called service workers, whatever the multi-threading thing in yeah, service the browser is. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. And then they fork the compiler off, but there's still like a ten megabyte bundle that you have to download initially, and there's Jeez. like a huge project. That's like uh, I think so, like reading an article on Medium, basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. um, well, get, first, getting through the first parallax, yeah. You didn't get any content by that point. But. Well, would that work, though, just compiling the GHCJS, the PureScript compiler, and then just running that for try PureScript? Because you have to, get, pack you have to, you have to get packages, um, like PSC package. Like, can you just request those dynamically from the browser? I suppose you no. could. Right now, it does, that's not the way. Right now, each backend has a fixed package set. Oh, I mean, right. Ellie, Ellie does allow that, but again, it's like a full IDE built into your browser. So it uses IndexedDB to store the package names and stuff. Oh, so interesting. that's possible, but it's, yeah, you need to just build an IDE in the browser, which is. <laughs> I didn't mean to suggest that this was the right way to do it. <laughs> Semi trivial. <laughs> but yeah, kind it's of a work. possibility, you know, yes. Kind of interesting. I wonder if that would work. It's yeah. worth creating an, an issue for discussion and interest and such if. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, it'd be nice to be able to add like a random package that you feel like, but for the point of the back end, that's a little bit more uh, complicated. Unless you did that exactly what we're talking about, you punted everything to GHCJS and punted all of it in the client side, and then did some wacky stuff like that. I think that'd be easier for like infrastructure point of view because you don't need to maintain a complex client server relationship. True. I'd be curious though how big that front end code would end up being. <laughs> uh, I'll put up an issue if nobody beats me to it. I'll just yeah, go for it. It's worth talking about at least. Um, oh, one last thing about the trap pure script I just want to ask. Um, so currently, um, in the source code of the trap pure script code, um, the URLs to the backends are hard coded. Um, so like if you're doing dev work on it, you have to go manually edit them and point them to where you have your backends running. And so when I was nixifying some of this stuff and getting to work in a container, obviously that doesn't work. Um, so I was wondering what sort of approaches people have taken in the past where you need to parameterize over like URLs based on like your dev or your production or wherever, especially with regards to pure script specifically, because I don't know a whole lot about all the build stuff. My only experience is with like using pulp build and that's it. Um, so it's just trying to get some input on that and see how I can approach parameterization of those URLs. So if you're dev, it automatically points to the right thing. If you, if you deploy the production, it automatically is the right URLs. 
what what I do for that is I set like an environment variable, <laughs> and like this endpoint, let's like endpoint name equals value. Yeah. Um, and then when the app starts up, it just reads from the environment. Yeah, so that um, works for server side code, right? But for the try peer script code, all of it's just client side code. Oh. Or for the UI part of it, that that's that's where I actually need the parameterization because each backend has a specific port as well. Um, for the the point. So one thing you could do is to just have like a URL module or something which import like which has like a like a root value in it that you import. And then you just regenerate that file and rerun the compiler. Kind of okay, thing. so do that as part of like a pre-build step. Yeah, something like that. Okay. I mean, if it's just a string, that should be simple enough to generate, I guess, with some templating thing. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much just backend name, which URL, and port it maps to. That's yeah. basically it. And does it not work with relative URLs? Just curious. What's um, the, it what's the would, problem there? Yeah, so it, it would, but then you'd have to add the, um, like a configuration in Nginx or something to route it to the correct backend. Oh, does it do course wise? Does it like, is the file hosting done on a different server than the compilation right now? I mean, uh, there are different processes, but there's no uh, reverse proxy in between. I didn't know that actually. So, no, so, okay, so maybe I explained this the wrong way. Like when you log into, the, when you, you're on Tribe Pure Script, you send some code, it posts to the server. And then from the server, then like Nginx basically uh, forwards it to a particular um, backend whose URL is actually hard coded in the uh, the client descending, I believe. Okay. So okay. So that well, it sounds like the simplest solution would be to put that into the, the Nginx configuration, then maybe and just. Yeah. Yeah. That that could be an issue, simplest thing. You use relative URLs in the client code. And then just have that routing automatically taken care of. Okay, I'll, I'll give that a shot. Because that sounds like it's a good fit for Nix, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you want to take a look at the current um, work, let's see, I've I've got basically up to the point of let's see, All right, pull up all the commits. So if you're interested in sort of deploying a Nix service container or whatever, um, there's a list of commits there that I sort of, um, you can take a look and I'll update the readme file. So if you want to try it locally, feel free to. Okay. So you want to use Nix to? Uh, For deploying and. To, to, to create a Docker-like container and then like upload that to like a container hosting service. I'm curious um, how, how you're thinking about doing hosting. Because yeah, like so if, if Phil has it right now, it's just like a really cheap, simple server. Yeah, and, and that works fine, right? So, like, what, I guess my goal in the back of my head with, with this stuff is I just want, like, a single command that builds all the stuff and deploys everything together. And if you need to maintain it, change the configuration. Don't You don't have to log into the server or anything um, locally. And then you can just basically nix a uh, copy closure or nix deploy or something, and you're done. Like, the less ad hoc things... Uh, to do, I think the better. Okay. And if other people want to work on it, it's you know it's a little easier. Anyway, that's enough for me. Thanks a lot for doing that work. Uh, it's very appreciated. I'm terrible with that kind of stuff, so it's very um, good that we have someone who knows what he's doing. I'm interested. Let's put it that way. So that's why I'm working. <laughs> Plus, I get to learn some stuff on my own, so that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, well, uh, I wonder what else we could uh, uh, discuss or work on here today. Joe just came on, so he probably has like three to four presentations uh, <laughs> ready and prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't think I have really much of anything. Um, Please don't, don't, don't stop. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the spot like that. I was just joking because you had good, so much good, good to see you, last Joe. Time. Last time. Yeah, good to see you. Um, let's see.
Yeah, we were doing some uh, browser spec implementation of some key codes just before we got this meeting started. Um, and there's always some PureScript documentation we could be looking at. Um, any other opinions from other people here? I've been, what's that, experience report? I've been hacking Rust the entire week. It's so nice to just have examples in every repository. I just copy everything. And for some I reason, totally it's a way. Like every repo should have a bunch of examples there. Like, bam, like right, right in pursuit. Like when you click on the package, it should just be there. Well, one of the problems with the packages I've seen in the PureScript world, at least, is like you can't put any examples into the into PureScript control, for example, because there's no data structures that you can apply all these classes and stuff to. Because all the data structures will import PureScript control, it's not the other way around. Oh, got it. I see. You can potentially link to a repo that serves as a good example of how one would use this library. So. Yeah, but you can't you can't do like executable snippets into the or like have right. things like execute co the the comments as doc tests or something to make sure they don't go out of date because you're not allowed to depend on these reports. So there you go. That's what you were talking or sorry, who was talking earlier? Don't remember. Um, I mean, but it, yeah, someone was mentioning earlier about getting GHCJS and trying script and all this stuff. And I think this could tie in potentially pretty nicely if you can have like runnable things, maybe, inside the docs or the documentation and procedures. So Rust has something? What does Rust have now? <laughs> you started by saying you've been playing with Rust and then you're talking about... Rust, Rust has copy build examples basically everywhere for every repo or like every library there is. But that's pretty simple because Rust has such an extensive standard library that there's like enough data types for anything you want to do or like this or show kind of. There is no library in Rust which only has control structure. Or if they if it does, there's a standard library to which you can apply all these control structures. So it's always easy to make examples. Is anyone here familiar with uh, Gabriel Gonzalez's like pretty famous tutorial modules and sort of like the Haskell world? You know that a lot of his libraries have a separate module that's compilable that acts as a tutorial for it. There was one that he tried to get pulled in the lens, but I can't remember exactly what the fallout was from that, why that didn't happen, but it seems like that's the type of thing that might be useful. I don't know how it would work out in terms of the module hierarchy, but to give people sort of a literate file example that they could step through and see how it's being used. Halogen kind of does this by having separate examples, but it doesn't ever really end up in line in pursuit. So you don't kind of get what Rust docs have where you can just basically read the docs for a module and be like, oh, I can just pull this thing out and then run it and use it, which I think what Christoph was talking about. Yeah, I'm curious about that. Yeah, there's basically there's a separate lens tutorial package because like I think we were saying it didn't get merged in, but a uh, question comes to mind. Is there such a thing as literate pure script? No, there's been discussion on the issues about it. But it comes down to uh, if you can do that with just like a simple shell script, then just do it with a simple shell script. So you could just um, have a shell script which reverses the comments in a pure script file. Yeah, I, I actually had something which used a simple shell script, which is not a shell script, but an ELA script. I had something with org mode basically, and I just tangled the, the stuff out, and that worked fine. But I'm not, I don't know. It'd be nice to I, have. I don't, I don't think I don't I don't think literate like Rust. The Rust examples are not literate source files or something. It's not like it's heavily annotated source code that is from the library or something. It's just small pieces of executable code basically that you can just take and put into. The, it's not the implementation of the library in an annotated form. It's examples using the library. Do you have any links to that? I haven't seen that before. I'm really curious. For example, this is the JSON serializing library. 
And I'm totally new to Rust, but I found that this is the one. And then the first six links in there. And then in the readme, there's like code that works kind of right away. Like, yeah. So. It seems like there's a link to a gist, which, yeah, you can go run it. I mean, yeah, that'd be pretty useful. We could tie that into like try pure script. Because I, I believe you can point to a gist as well. Oh, yeah, you can totally do that. But you'd need the backend to have the library loaded. Right. Right. So if your work on automating TriPureScript works out really well, um, <clears throat> we could make it maybe like make it really easy to host another instance of that. Yeah. Um, well, if Is you want some documentation for your library, you just host a little instance of that and pay like $5 a month or something. Yeah. Curious, is there a meta uh, acne all package equivalent in PureScript? That basically just references all the other packages on PureScript. You could get the whole package set from PSC package, right? Does anything stop you from doing that? Um, don't you have to build your own for PSC package? Like I'm not familiar with that works. There's there's the big one, right? That that's like the the main the package sets repo in GitHub. Oh, that yeah, that doesn't include everything though, unfortunately. It doesn't, but it offers an easy path where if you know if if uh, try pure, pure script drew from that. Hmm. Uh, you could say in some automated way, if you get your, your library into the PSC package set, then it's available in try peer script. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, like most of the backends right now, they all use that current package set anyway, um, except Flare, which doesn't work um, locally. Yeah, that's a good point. That would be good because that's kind of like a motivation to keep your thing up to date as well. Because we provide you the service to be able to do like nice examples mm. for free if you keep your stuff up to date with the rest of the ecosystem. It's kind of a nice incentive, I guess. Yeah, that is. That'd be pretty cool, actually. All right, this, this is nice because this gives me more motivation to do this. So. <laughs> So just generally also, I really like the way that um, Halogen's examples are set up, where if you go to the main repository, um, you've got the, the readme sort of documentation, but you also have a subdirectory with many different examples. I get, similar to what the Surdy stuff was, um, where there's nothing in line, but you do have a whole bunch of different stuff showing different component hierarchies separate from Gary's actual book. Um, and I think that's probably a pretty great way to go about doing this. I feel like if you can condense uh, an example down into a single main module and maybe with some other supporting modules, but a, a single executable entry point, then that too, if you could get a compatible package set in try pure script, you could just basically have that go to a gist and try pure script and actually execute to from there. Um, does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Um, one of the curious things for me, um, like I'm relatively new to the pure script world, if you will. A um, bit more background in Haskell stuff, but mostly in Java and Python. Um, and so like when I go to learn about a library or something, like maybe my expectations, I'm pulling them from Python and from like Java, where it's like, I expect the documentation to be there on the library like itself. Like I don't, I shouldn't have to go to its repo dig in the source code and find examples that, yeah, like it's just not a normal pattern for me that I'm now figuring out this is what I need to do. Um, just kind of want to mention that maybe. Oops. So yeah, so what, one thing that happened for a lot or happened, yeah, happened for a lot of the core libraries is that um, usually the tests are where all the examples are kind of because that part is also compiled in CI because we didn't have we don't have that doc test stuff which compiles the comment section and it's like super tedious to keep these things up to date when you don't have a compiler which makes sure that your stuff still works kind of. So that's why a lot of that is in the test folder. Not saying that's a good like that's a good U UX or something, but <laughs> just saying like that's how these things happen. 
Yeah, no, I've been definitely been digging around more in the tests as well. Yeah, like you said, the core libraries for sure. Um, like, is there an easy way to, like, as a user or someone who possibly wants to contribute, like, is there an easy way for a person to say, hey, I've added an example to this function in this particular library that other people on Pursuit can just look at? Like, is that something we would want? Is that something useful? Is that kind of crappy? Is that not good? Well, the easiest way would be to PR the library and put it, the example into the comment for the function that we're talking about, because that renders on Pursuit and gets like marked down if I had so. Thing is, it's kind of hard to keep these things from not going out of date. And I think we, not saying that it's not a worthwhile contribution to put some examples in there now, but we need to find a way to handle the maintenance overhead that we'll create eventually. I mean, being able to just draw things out into a gist and put them on TriPSCO kind of provides that because if your stuff doesn't compile anymore, it's not going to work in the package with the package set, kind of. Yeah, I think this is a good idea for us to do. Yeah, if, it, if the library could have at least a link that points to just do TriPSCO script, that's already so much better. And then if it's in the README, um, if you like make it convention, then if it is in the README, then when you go to Pursuit for the library, the first thing you're going to see is the overview. And you could see a list of links to interactive tri -pure script just there. So it kind of helps discoverability through Pursuit. So you don't have to jump around to the repo itself. You'll get a runnable example if you search for the library and you end up on the, the library name. Yeah, yeah. I'm liking this more and more. <laughs> Just trying to picture in my head like how the try peer script backend stuff works, and I think it's very, very doable. Shortly, even. One downside to this is that none of the Node.js stuff will work in a sense because none of that will work in a browser, oh. but. I mean, yeah, it's true. that's fine. That you just need the conventional documentation there. And I, well, in my experience, the PureScript Node documentation is actually better than Node.js documentation. So, <laughs> because even just having types is makes these APIs so much easier to understand. All right, so I just did a quick check on the, the backends for TriPureScript, and currently they all point to the package sets repo, all of them. So that's an interesting, oh, right, right. The packet sets are the same, but some of them have a different main initialization function for the backend. Um, and they don't load all the extras because, well, okay, so I can, I'm not sure how you, how well you're acquainted with how TriPS works internally, like the has like the compiler side of things. But I can give a short introduction if you want. Yeah, please. Okay, okay. So the compiler, when it compiles a module, generates an extras file, uh, which is kind of the 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 product that we use for incremental compilation. All right, so that's basically a header file or something, I guess. I don't know. It contains all the types and, uh, and definitions that are exposed from a module. And so when you have the extrans file and you have, well, when you have the extrans files which make up all the dependencies below a module that you're trying to compile, you can compile that module by just looking at that module's source code. And TriPureScript grew out of PSCIDE, which uses the same thing to make these rebuilds fast, where it 
takes a single source file and has all the extras cached in memory and just runs the compiler against that for that single module against the cached extras files. Right. Uh, but that means that the extras files are all in memory. And you kind of need to take care of how many packages are, or like how many modules end up in that package set. Because if there's some like huge generated uh, kind of thing in there, that might end up taking too much memory on your server. Um, yeah, this was a problem uh, about six months ago, I guess, when Phil just needed to upgrade from like two gigs to four gigs or something. So it's something you can just throw money at, but yeah, eventually become non-trivial to pay for. Well, you could do a thing like throw a, like an LRU cache at it or something and just disk out the actions files um, that have not been used for, for a while. Just might make the thing slower at some point. I don't know. It's an interesting take for sure. And somehow, no JavaScript uh, project even eats anywhere near the amount of memory of Slack. <laughs> I think everyone can agree on that. PCID is up to two gigs on the Slam data repo, like running on Slam data now. So, only. But yeah, that's still below Slack, right? Yeah, you're right, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think of like even like VidTracker as having like too many modules, but it's like yeah, it's it's like nothing, like a couple hundred megs. So even Emacs is bigger. This memory thing is something to I guess be aware of. I, I still don't think we should not do it just because of that. I think it's still a great idea. To be sure, this infrastructure, the moment someone nefarious wants to DOS it, it's done, right? Sure. Uh, Maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure how all that. Currently, I'm not sure what, what, what's being done to prevent that. I think it's probably easy to dust it. I think generating HTTP requests is probably going to be easier than doing the compilation. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Don't go testing that, though. I, I, that was not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could put it behind something like Cloudflare. But even then, I'm not sure if. Um, Cloudflare will detect that as a DDoS attack because we might just use too much CPU. Yeah, I, I, yeah, on I a think it's, request. it's it's kind of if someone wanted to just make something really ugly compile multiple times, there's nothing that's really going to stop them. And and working on something that would do that, uh, it just seems like it'd be a terrible time waste. Um, yeah, I mean. There are, I was thinking a little earlier, like you, you could sort of give a user a short lived per process compilation unit, basically. And then when their session disappears, you kill that little container thing. But that jumps into the point of and now every user takes up memory, more memory than just having a single shared resource. You could try the GHCJS thing, you see, see if it works, guys, <laughs> it's remotely reasonable. Yeah, yeah. It might end up actually being the easier thing. Well, Luke worked on it for two and a half years, so. Yeah, that's a long time, geez. <laughs> well, he rebuilt the entire make part of the Elm compiler, so he compiled the thing, the part of the Elm compiler which does the actual compilation, so parser, type checker, and code gen, basically. But then he rewrote all of the logic that does the like scheduling and dependency management between the modules and like instructs the compiler to compile individual modules. He rewrote all of that in JavaScript and now like Elm 
I think with a lot of JavaScript and now in PureScript. So he rewrote like a huge part of the compiler because of course you can't use the threading model of GHCJS to do like the service work and stuff that he's doing for compilation. So yeah, it's a non-trivial project. <laughs> I think I'm ready to get back to work on the UI events key spec if that's interesting. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So I cleaned stuff up. Um, I actually made a peer script file now, which is nice. Test.generate. So um, I guess most of you didn't really hear what we were working on, but uh, so there's this file here. It's the basically. It isn't quite HTML, but it's almost HTML. It's used to define the spec for keyboard events and the key values used for it. Um, so there's just, there's like introduction and then there's just big tables of keys. Um, and so I'm working on parsing it just so we can get the data in an automatic fashion. Um, and not like go through and write it all ourselves. Um, so I actually have a file now that has pure script code. This is fun. Um, so I was, so I parsed keys earlier. That's fine. You just, uh, yeah, you just look for things that start with key space and that's usually a key. And then you, once you hit a tab character, you drop it. Um, and so I just added parsing of categories. So this is a really bad parser. <laughs> but um, each line will end with something that says the name of the categories, then keys, then it will end the uh, third level header. So then we look for the end of the starting tag and take the stuff after that, and then this should be a new line. And then we take it and give it a better name. So for IME and composition, I'm just going to call that composition. And then your um, FN keys are just going to be called function. And other things stay the same. And then you replace um, space with uh, nothing. You take out the space and suddenly it's a valid ADT name. <laughs> um, so I haven't actually tested this. So gen.run, does this work? Yes. Okay. So here's the list of categories. Um, special modifier, white space navigation, blah, blah, blah. And then these are the list of keys that are given a name. So our favorite is unidentified. It tells you literally nothing. Uh, and then here's like your modified keys, everything else. You can set a timer on your TV or at least detect when your timer was set on your TV. <laughs> uh, there's literally everything in here. So now I want to associate each key with a category. Um, so I have my functions for parsing keys and parsing categories. Um, I think what I want to do now is um, do something that looks like so parse either, um, and then we'll do, yay, auto imports, it's so fun. Uh, <laughs> and then, so we'll try and parse a category or we're going to parse a key. Um, Let's switch these around.
and okay and then So what I'm hoping for is, I'm hoping this will give me a, um, a way to associate my each key with a category. So we're going to have our categories show up and then we're going to have each key show up. So this is looking pretty good. Um, now I need some kind of fold that goes over this. Um, right fold, got any suggestions? Uh, <laughs> do I have chat up? What were you trying to do? Um, so I have a list of my, so my categories and my keys are in the same list and I need to associate them together. Can I call chat up here? I'm not sure where that is. Oh, here, here's chat. Okay. Um, so I don't have my web browser open right now, so. Not enough RAM? Uh, I'm doing okay right now, but I don't want to open Chrome. <laughs> uh, so the question is whether we use like map -acume. Oh, cool. We have types here. Um, either do like a map -acume or a, just like a plain fold on. Um, Sorry for the fold out being, yeah. Uh, sorry for the diversion. I'm just kind of curious. Are you still using the language server uh, protocol one for the Atom plugin, or is this back to the vanilla one? Um, this is the vanilla one. This is a different computer, so I haven't had the language server set up. Um, it wasn't really working for me last time I tried it. So. Um, So our result, we want our result to be something like a map from string to string. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> so this will be our categories, and then this will be our keys that are in the categories. Um, Fold L and then we need some function. Um, probably, yeah, uh, that's good enough. Fold L function and then so we'll start with data. It's a map from what to what? Um, a string to string? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wait, no, I think string to array string is what we want. Is this a category name to its keys? Yeah, exactly. Oh, some category theory, I see, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. You can't escape the category theory. Um, and then stuff. Um, I'm not getting type holes, type holes. Huh. Is the compiler not working? Do you get any errors? Hmm. 
Maybe you have to rebuild? Or just reset the IDE? Could be. It's funny how autocomplete works. <laughs> huh. Maybe you don't have the Linter stuff set up in your Atom thingy? I don't know. Um, this isn't the... Um, I guess that's a good thing to check. I have linter, which is what we need. Yeah, that should work. Server. Hmm. Oh. Says it started. I mean, worst case, we just go back and do this. Yeah. So, we don't actually want this to be our state for fold L. We want something like um, tuple, nothing. So we can keep track of our category in here. Um, let's just call this folding. Then, so, Here's our state and then that. Okay, I'm a little annoyed at which direction the arguments go, so let's flip that around. So if we have a left, that means we have a category. So, and then we don't care what our existing category is there but we do want to preserve the map, so it's just going to be tuple, cat, and our map. And right, if we have a key, and then if we have, I guess this can just go like that. Um, if we have nothing, we'll just preserve our state and do nothing. Because if we, we shouldn't encounter a key before a category, but if we do, let's just do nothing. Key, tuple, cat, and if we encounter a key, we're going to preserve our category, but then in, um, maybe I want to do it the other way from a key to a category, so I don't have to deal with like a multi-map sort of structure. So we're going to insert insert goes from a key value and then a map. Key is going to have that and then <laughs> rip that. It's always funny when I like write all these Things and there's autocomplete and I could really hit enter and actually let it autocomplete and import for me, but nope. Uh, yeah, so I need to do a just around my category there. I was like, By the oh, way, why don't you use pulp dash w run or something or pulp dash w build? Uh, um, I mean, hopefully it works. Lazy e right now. CID. What? Oh, and then we're going to want to do. Oh, does does this work? Huh, okay, so I can't 
type annotate it anymore, but should be right. Uh, wait, what? Hmm. So what pulp build minus W? And the minus w goes before the, the minus w goes before the build. Cool. Wait, what? Oh, it's not building tests, so this. Uh, yeah, you can also do pull dash double. Uh, well, whatever. If it works, it's fine. Okay. Um, that's kind of weird that they don't reorganize the bindings in lat. Maybe that's a do notation thing. Oh, cool. I've recently looked at that code, so I think I know why it's broken, but. Okay. Now, here, um, I think I want to return result. This is, oh, I guess externs is getting, um, populated by the build. <laughs> uh, Just comment it out and pull in the suggestion. I'll just do the Justin thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why are these? Maybe I needed the type annotation. Um, right. Just cat. Ah, I'm used to doing up arrow. Okay, I'm lazy. Watch this. Um, that, that string, string, and then we have a couple of maybe string. Uh, you're going to need parents around the map construct there. Thanks. Gotta love our kind errors. <sighs> uh, which line? Line 42. Uh, I guess we'll have to rewrap this category. Okay. okay, that's looking a little better. So, the problem nice. is- Nice, very cool. Thanks. Uh, we just lost our ordering on these keys. Um, so 
list. Do we have list? Yes, we have list. So maybe let's just do a cons list on that. So instead of insert, we'll just um, l dot cons. Where is it expecting a map? I think you had a tuple nothing m dot empty. You probably want l dot nil. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so now it's backwards, but it's in the right order. <laughs> so if I fold R, okay, so it starts with Oh, what? Oh, <laughs> this is not fun. So that right now the keys are in the right order, but they're associated with the wrong category. They're um, associated with like the next category because we're folding from the right now. So, um, I would like to convert this to an array. So from foldable, yeah, it is. And then we have a reverse method. Maybe this works. Nope. Oh. <laughs> okay. Unidentified is in the special category, correct? Alt is a modifier. These are all modifiers. Function keys look good. Fn, F1 to F12, and soft are also function keys. Cool. Now I guess I need to think about how to display this all in a module format. So. Right now I have, let's call this like associations. So right now I have my categories. I have my keys and I have my associations. So I'll want to generate a couple algebraic data types. Um, So, um, are there names for these in the spec? I guess I can, let's just start with category. Data category equals, and then,
and just keep the categories. So this looks good. Special modifier white space, blah, blah, blah. All those look like valid cat uh, or data type names, constructor names. Um, next, should we just call this key? Um, And then we need a special constructor here. What should this be? I think it takes, we'll take a string and then string with So basically these are all those special keys that are identified in the spec, but for like space or any other sort of key, they'll, um, Um, just come in as a string and the convention is that the string is um, I think this is the right one Anyway, so it's a unicode sequence of Like a glyph a composed glyph and then any other like combining characters um, that go go in it. Yeah, so I just slumped IME and composition keys together under composition. I I think that's a little more general, but not my area of expertise. Yeah, I just I just call those things IME. I'm not. I suppose composition is like textual composition, like what language you want to use to compose your things. But, um, yeah. I think composite. Yeah, and it also refers to like dead keys, um, where if you're typing like an accent of some sort, you can type the accent first. It'll have a little highlighted thing and then you type your character you want under the accent um like i i use this on mac can you see my screen? oh yeah okay so this is what it looks like so it highlights the thing and there's a spec for how um for how what series of events the browser will see for this. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, is there is there a a library for generating PeerScript code? Well, I mean a PeerScript library. Um I don't think so. So okay. Maybe I want to fix up my keys now. So these function keys, I don't like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. So now the next thing I want to do is um, key category. So we associate these together based on the list we already had. Um, so this goes key to category, um, traverse, um, maybe I want four, yeah, four associations.
Um, I think you got a typo there. Key to category. Do one too many O's. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. What would be really fun is if we could have this test suite that goes and generates the file, but then it also would run the compiler to verify that we produce. Yeah, um, you could do that. Just like a little bash bash script or something. <laughs> yeah. You got another another spelling mistake. Uh, line fifty. There's one too many O's in category. Uh, oh, thanks. crystals on it too. <laughs> thanks. Um. What's going on here? Oh, I missed. Uh, maybe I'll put chat on the. Can I move this? Nope. You're trying to view the Zoom chat while working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why. That's one of the reasons that you know I kind of think that using Slack for chat during these instead of. The Zoom chat, like the Slack chat, is you know really good pop-ups. <laughs> yeah, true. Except I close Chrome, so those probably won't show up. <laughs> um. Wait, did I save the file? I don't need to see myself. Line fifty two. Could not match type string. So. Oh, oh, we need to log this once uh, applicative to combine it. Okay, there. So this looks good. So identified as just in the special category. Um, we probably need a special case for our character. Um, what's, the, what's the purpose of the category from like an API user point of view? Um, well, it's in the spec, so it must be important. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would, if you, it just provides a nice way to handle all of these. So like, let's say you're only interested in function keys. You might as well just like filter out what things don't have the function category. Um, but it would be nice if there was actually a way to decompose these better. Um, so the alternate thing we could do, so this is just a plain algebraic data type that literally lists every key available to um, human ex known to human existence. Um, and this is just another data type. So we have a couple other options. We could make basically split this key up into um, something that implicitly has the category structure. So we could say like have us special keys algebraic data type that contains unidentified. We could have a modifier keys algebraic data type that contains all of these. And our key could be like special, special key, modifier, modifier key, et cetera. So that would be more of a tree structure. Um, so that would help, like if you only wanted to look at function keys, then you would, um, look for anything that has a function constructor, and then you could explicitly match F1 through F12, and then soft one and soft port. Um, and you wouldn't have to deal with partial functions because you would know your data type is only representing that. Oh, for pattern matching. So if I write a function that's uh, like on key down here, I expect to only see a function key. So you'll only like pattern match that function key. Mm -hmm. But yeah, anyways, this, this will be a pretty low level library. So um, yeah, it'd be nice to, you know, kind of, kind of optimize this a little bit. And then the other representation, I'll 
um, just sketch out here is we could have a variant. So key equals, yeah, equals variant. And then we could say character, character would get a string. But then you have to like quote everything if you want them uppercase. Um, and then we could say like, and then F1 would be its own unit case. And then you could do like um, type function keys. Um, then each, basically each category would have its own list of things. Um, and then this would be like, if you wanted to add them all together. So this would actually look like, um, you would apply them to each other and then they would take a argument corresponding to what else you want to put besides their own, if that makes sense. It's the pattern seen in like the DOM index library, um, if you're familiar with that. So like you have interactive, um, that specifies like what events an interactive element might have. And then like your HTML div um, uses that interactive to specify that it has these interactive behaviors and it also has whatever other properties it can accept. Um, so any thoughts on what's the best way to design this? I don't know. I don't think I have it all in my head. But yeah, like this will be used in like if statements, right? Um, Uh, like 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 you, you you'd attach a key a key press handler and then in the in, in the peer script handler for that you'd you know check the check the type of it right. Do you usually just match on the uh, the actual final key so like F one and everything or do you also check the category quite often? Um, I was thinking the category would be helpful for eliminating keys you don't care about, but um, I think you're right that um, you're right that you just tend to match one. Um, you just I think this would just be easier to use because yeah. Then if you did care about the category and the key itself, like calling a function just to say, okay, what's the category for this? And then making a tuple out of that and matching on the tuple isn't too bad. Otherwise, if the category was really important, then you could make it like a nested sum type, but that probably wouldn't make a lot of people happy. Yeah. Also, the other thing is like what to do about this. So the space character isn't its own thing. Um, I don't know if there's a good way to make that explicit other than documentation. Um, uh, can we just special case transform it to space, the word? Um, I would not do that. I want to follow the spec and be clear about where these names come from. And like, yeah. I mean, it's, I'm just thinking about like the case where like uh, the CSS class names from JS are like all camel case because they're not compatible with the actual CSS names. Yeah. Or like the HTML attributes and stuff too. Maybe we can just have like a 
Um, just like as a reminder, um, Do that. Yeah, that sounds fair. And then, um, and then you're, for almost all of your use cases, you're going to have like a all through case anyways. Um, so maybe like if you wanted to do this properly, you, you could say um, key where key, Category key not equal category or not equal like function. Then you just exit early and then you end up with your function keys and then you still have a follow through case. Um, and then there's the other thing, like the spec lists out up to 12. Um, but it also says you can go higher if you want to. So I'm wondering if this should just be like a constructor that takes an integer or something. And same with soft keys. That sounds like a good idea. So now is the goal here to be like a nice API or is it to be just a strict, you know, what does the spec show us? Yeah. I mean, I mean, if there's like a way to do these specific cases, then I think like just having a one through 12 as an actual like constructor is fine. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you, you would do special cases. And I guess the, um, so, um, I mean, in the end, there's uh, some kind of FFI function for this, right? That would take like string, whatever, and whatever. Huh? Um, there will be a, parse function, parse key that goes string to key. And I'm not sure whether this should be total or partial, because I think we can just stick anything else into the character constructor, but then we might violate some invariance there. We might want to um, validate Um, where like um, we verify that this is just one character followed by combined binding characters. And maybe even a normalized function. So like normalize character, if we have a new line, then we want that to become the enter key, I believe. You could do uh, triple quotes to get all these things into one, one uh, line if, you're not, if you'd like. Thanks, that's a good idea. Um, will log print out new lines? Probably.
Yeah, I think it does. Yeah, and it doesn't truncate any of the, or it doesn't strip any of the white space. Okay, well that's easy enough to do. And then, do I need to escape? Yeah. But these I shouldn't need to escape. We'll see how this turns out. Um, yeah, I'm not going to turn that. Okay, that works. Man, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Generating pure skip code like a pro. Thanks. Console that log. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like code gen. I like working on meta things instead of actually doing stuff. <laughs> um. And then we can derive the instances for key itself. Should be good. Is normalizing this part of the spec? I see it have a normalized function. Um, I wonder if like part of the point of having these keys be named is that we have the browser normalize them for us. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but. Like, we can verify that, or the input that we're getting from like a key event should be normalized, right? But, um, um, but sometimes we're not always sure. Um, and right, so I wonder if that should be in like a separate, like a user, like some other user's library. I mean, yeah, it'd be nice to have this library just do only spec, only spec stuff, but that's, it's up to you. Okay, um, but like if you're generating a key, it might be nice just to have that guarantee that you know it's going to have something to catch you to make sure you conform to the spec. Um, uh, by the way, is there a, like a operator for compose and map? I feel like there should be, but I haven't found it. Cause it's so common. Uh, I wonder if you could just write the function signature out and uh, put a hole. Um, does do holes pick up operators? Let's see. Well, pure script the operators are just sugar for whatever the named sure. function is. Um, yeah, compose and map. So for all <laughs> um, what is this? So A to F B, then we need a B to C and a this A to F C. I think that's right. Unsafe course. Okay, we have to. <laughs> so, for one, you're never going to find that thing because you didn't put any constructors on it. Um, oh, sorry, any constraints, right? You can't actually operate on the thing in there. Okay. Uh, but as far as I can tell, that's just applying the first function and then mapping the second <laughs> of the result. Yeah. So, just compose it out of these two functions. Yeah. 
but we have like closely composition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I asked this. I asked this question the other, the other day. Um, that would be that would be appropriate if you had a B to F C there. Like, yes. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Like, like the reason that a function like this isn't in Prelude or similar is because it's easy enough for you just to define it in your own project with like three words. <laughs> Not even define it, but just use it in line. That's the idea. Like, yeah, yeah. You shouldn't give it a name if the name is longer than just building it. <laughs> Wait, um, what happened to this? Not match type with B to C. Oh, whatever. It works. Parse key. Okay. Um, so I think parsing the key will be the hard part. And then um, So there's like special cases we might have to handle, like apparently edge or something return just down instead of arrow down. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Browser specifics. Yeah, but I think that is the kind of thing we want to make sure is handled properly in this library. So users of this library don't have to care about that. Yeah, absolutely. If we just do the right thing here, it should be good to go. OK, so yeah. And then we'll want probably like a show instance and then a monomorphic show. Um, <laughs> um, we probably don't want like key suffixes on anything. It might just be nice to have them import it qualified. Yes, please. Um, I'd like us all to do that more. Yeah. Well, I think we're doing that a lot, even, like already. But I found like using the qualified style to be nice. So key category, just category, get category. Do you like that? Yeah, so what would that be? That would be key.category if you use it. Yeah. Yeah, category is fine. I wouldn't mind get category as well. But. Yeah, I feel like the pure script community doesn't really use git, though. Yeah, I was it's, thinking of like it's, it reads key get category if you spell it out. But again. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. If you think it in terms of functions, like we say f yeah. of x, so it, I think people yeah. think it's like the category of your key. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then I have no idea what to do here. What's the category of character? It's not special. Ordinary? <laughs> um, Or we could just cop out and be like, <laughs> it might have a category, it might not. Do you think that makes sense? Mm. <laughs> maybe we should do maybe of maybe of categories so we can have null and undefined. I'd I'd prefer if you fold that into the category sum actually because um, okay that way it can't be confused with other maybes. But we can't call it character. Sorry. What? Yeah. 
Mm. So then if you do that though, then, the, then that what category type letter? isn't a direct mapping of what's in the spec. Could you use letter? Or does that, is that for more than just a letter? <clears throat> um, I mean, like the minus key isn't a letter. So it would pick the minus key. So it's a non-modifier or something? I don't know. What does it? Oh, maybe let's call this Unicode. It'll just be whatever Unicode stuff is entered. And then this can be like character. Seems okay. Um, then we just need to change all the times I already used it. Because a lot of this is already dependent on what Unicode means. Um, key and then string. I don't actually remember how to do a prism. It's probably okay. And then you can do fun stuff like um, Is space key. Um, I don't know what's the best way to do this. Preview Unicode. So if we have don't have it, it's false. If we do have it, then like Unicode. That is space or something. Um, maybe what we also want, like a code point. Um, So this would probably be more like I don't know. Sorry, my coding style is kind of messy. <laughs> but when your whole program is in a big string. <laughs> I like point free, but that's yeah, not going to work out here. Um, let's do there. That looks okay. Do we have? That array dot singleton. Yeah, I prefer pure. Just <laughs> so I don't it's, have to. Enjoy. I mean, it's short. Yeah. 
So parse, unparse. Um, for parse, we probably just want to go through each key and like wrap in quotes on one side and not on the other. Do we want, like, a, what kind of show instance do we want? None? Derived or unparsed? Or so this would just do that? Make show instances a debug thing purely, in my opinion. Yeah. So try to make them not useful. <laughs> okay, so probably like the, like what the ADT looks like. Yeah, the generic drive one, or I mean, you can hand do the thing. But I don't think, do we have drive for show? Not from the compiler, through generics we have it, but. Oh, okay, that would, that might work. I mean, that makes it slow and not very useful, so. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right, yeah, I don't as well. Okay. Have a nice Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone.